All right. A very good day, folks, wherever you're joining us from today. A very good day to each and every one of you guys. We trust that you good. We trust that you well. All of you who are joining us today from around the world, welcome to our international podcast. Below the belt, who vex vex, who vex lose. We are super happy that you folks can join us today. Peace and power. Peace and power. We're just simply happy that you folks are here. We're outside, folks. It's Tuesday, believe it or not, the 30th day of May. It's month 10. Did we tell you that? It's month 10 already. It's the end of the month. We got one day left really and truly. Tomorrow. And then we're in a June. There's my birth month, folks. The 30th day of June. The 30th day of June. I'm super happy to have all of you at this end. Along with us on this journey, folks. Along with us on this journey. Tomorrow's the 31st day of May. And then we in a June. Right into June. We hope that you guys are so much closer to some of those hopes and dreams and aspirations, your plans and your goals. We hope that you guys are so much closer to that. Seeing all the usual suspects out there. Good to see you folks on the live. Share the damn live. Smash that emoji button, guys. Let me go down the road, good folks. I say let me go down. Go down for one time. Let me go down, folks. Let me go down the road. Good to see each and every one of you. And we are simply privileged to have all of you folks on the live with us. Now we sit. We're on the live. We're going to be joined by a special guest today. I told you we sat down recently with Vola and Lawrence. We're going to show you the extent of that discussion today for our new insert for our evening program in the ring. We have a new insert. Y'all know we got back channels with Professor Shamir Ali. Well, the insert we have now is the whip, the new one. We focus more or less on the works in Parliament, the work in the National Assembly of Guyana. And we're going to be talking with Comrade Valda Lawrence on that front. On that front, we're going to be talking with her. What's going on? You know, what was, what is, and what should be this 30th day of May, or 30th episode, fourth season, simply means we've done 300 plus, 330. You know, every 100 um, episode we have, we start over, and we're talking with Valda and Lawrence today. So privileged to be talking with a veteran member of parliament, a consummate, Politician, strategist, tactician, you name it. Privileged to have her with us. But we got to get through a couple of things. We got to get through. Got to get through a couple of things, folks. Okie dokes. Okie dokes. Got to get through. A couple of things. Great to have you guys with us. Nonetheless, on the live. Good to have each and every one of you on the live today. Share, 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 share. <laughs> share the live, folks. Smash that emoji button. Let me go down the road. Got a couple of things we're going to share with you guys. And then we out of your ears. You get to comrade Volda Lawrence. Hey, what she has to say about the goings on in Parliament. Folksweather.com, where we pick up our news of the weather. It's happening outside. This says 29 degrees. 29 degrees outside. So it feels like 34. It's very humid these days. Have you folks found that? It's very humid. Very. So it feels like 34 degrees. 18% chance is going to rain. I suggest if you're going out, folks, especially here, this is the weather for the national capital city. We're in Georgetown, Region 4. Well, we're into the mid-June rain, no, sir. We're into the mid-June rain, so we, we're taking it as it comes. We're taking it as it comes. We got 
we got that to deal with. We got the major and rain to deal with. And then we're moving forward. We're moving forward. In strides. Moving forward in strides. We got that to deal with. Among some other things. Feels like 34 outside. That's weather wise. Great to see all of you joining the live on this on this good day. It's a fairly decent day. Fairly decent day. We're thankful for all of you joining on the live. And give you a sense of some of the things happening outside. Outside. Good folks. All the usual suspects are here with us, guys. Let's have a go at it. Some of those things we're following. Let's have a go at it. Uh, first up, some of the stuff trending out there. This war in Ukraine. New chicken, like it coming home to roost. The chukons, like they're coming home to roost. Folks, you know, they're telling us that large-scale drone attack, as you can see the headline there, hits Moscow for the first time in Ukraine war. You know, a lot of countries have been giving a lot of munitions and support to Russia, to, um, to, to the Ukraine. Some giving to Russia too, I, I ain't wrong. I ain't wrong. A lot of them been giving to Russia as well. But it's China. So they said this is a rare strike in Russia's capital unnerves Muscovites. The thing coming closer? Right? Apparently they were told that this conflict won't threaten them. Because little old Ukraine don't have the firepower, don't have the artillery to come all that way. But Moscow Galash. It's a large scale drone attacks. I wish we didn't have war in this world. Right. 15 months on this war in Ukraine. It says this marks a new inflection point in a conflict that has the Kremlin, that the Kremlin said would never threaten the lives of ordinary Russians. That's how so confident they were. Never threaten the lives of ordinary Russians. That's Putin, Vladimir Putin. Has he overplayed his hand? It's a good question. A good question anyone could ask. Has he, has he overplayed his hands, folks? Has he overplayed his hands? Well, this thing has come home now. Ukraine didn't start this war. No, they didn't start it. But certainly, certainly, folks, they're fighting back. Fighting back. You ain't just roll over and play no dead here, you know. Sometimes you gotta fight, you know. Let's fight. Sometimes you gotta stand your ground. You ain't backing down. You know, I sure, I sure like, I sure like, like us, the Ukrainians are peaceful people. Struggling, they struggle. Certainly don't look for trouble. Just ask around. <laughs> Remembering the words of that Dave Martin song. They ain't giving up no country. That belongs to them. The folks are fighting back there. Fighting back there. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. You ain't got no turning back now. You, know? you got no reset. You know? So the folks are fighting back there. That's some of what we're following on the Ukraine-Russia front. Russia began to tell us a couple... Weeks ago, months ago, don't cut. Don't cut where you can't fetch. Don't cut where you can't fetch. Don't cut where you can't fetch. In Uganda, 
Brothers and sisters, over in Uganda, they've passed a law to stop human organ harvesting and trade. Leadership got to fix problems. Leadership has got to fix problems. And they're telling us the Ugandan president, Yuiri Museveni, am I calling his name right? Apologies if I'm off. An accent or two. He has assented to this new law aimed at preventing. That's what they're telling us. Aimed at preventing the theft of human organs and tissues in the country's health ministry. This was announced just today. And this is the bill is called the Human Organs Donation and Transplant Bill. You know, Americans got some Ugandans in them walking around. All the people around the world. You know, many. They said the Human Organ Donation and Transplant Bill of 2023 was introduced in response to reports of an increase in the illicit trade in and trafficking of human organ cells and tissues. You walking down some side street, there's a jambi lash. You wake up on some a liver gun, a kidney missing, some cells and some tissues. So now they're attempting here in this human organ donation and transplant bill to remedy some of the malady. Leadership gotta fix problems. I ain't see Museveni going to vote for me. And I can help you keep your lungs and your liver. Leadership gotta fix problems. Got to fix problems. That's what they've been up to in Uganda. Said the law aims to protect vulnerable groups. How are your lungs and your other organs doing? How are your liver and your lungs? How are you all doing? It aims to protect vulnerable groups, particularly women, who are tricked into undergoing surgeries and having their organs sold in global trafficking networks. Networks. It also forms part of the government's strategic plan to address health challenges in a country where non-communicable diseases are on the rise. Gotta watch that. Gotta watch that. It is expected to save Ugandans astronomical sums spent on authorized organ transplantation abroad. So you see, the Ugandans fixing some issues. We got to do likewise. We got to stop bobbing and weaving. Bobbing and weaving. You think you understand? Bobbing and weaving. Bobbing and weaving. Actually, fix some problems. G come talking about problems. <laughs> talking about problems. G come locally telling us that parties and groups and individuals contesting local government elections sign on to the Ethnic Relations Commission's Code of Conduct. We happy for them. We are happy for them. We happy for them. See? But who's monitoring it? Because we see a lot of transgressions by a lot of things by the PPP. A lot of transgressions. Who monitoring it? That's why you want to. 
You know, we got a lot of laws on the book. A lot of laws on the books, but who monitoring them? That is the real crux. Crux of the matter. Who monitoring them? Can't put cat for watch milk. PPP. Can't put cat to watch milk. So who monitoring? The transgressor. Right? And let's say that some group individual or party run afoul of these this code of conduct. Some of them are conducting the properly. Don't fool yourself. If they're running afoul of that, who will be there to rein them in? Huh? I saw some politicking in relation to the girls. Some Maria parading them. Political theater. Ooh, monitoring air fun. To say big sahib. Big sahib. Pull back. Pull back. You know the bigger the vessel is, the harder it is to turn. The harder it is to turn. We only got the Titanic to prove that. Only got the Titanic to prove that. So who monitoring them? And how are folks going to be held accountable? Huh? How can they be held accountable if 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 they're transgressions? How are they going to be held accountable? Hmm? How, hmm. folks? I'm happy for the folks who sign on. Good for y'all. Good for y'all. I'm happy for y'all. Ain't gonna lie. Be happy for y'all. <laughs> Some of us happening on the local government front. Local government election front. Some of that. And then they're telling us here now. Erfan. Orphan, extremely proud of persons who lent support to the Madhya Fire. <laughs> they said he's extremely proud. Right? You know, a lot of first responders not getting the credit that they should. A lot of folks not getting the credit that they should. They're not getting the credit. And those who were on the ground first, they say, uh, don't bother with these cats. Some people getting recognized and some people getting no recognition. And again, in this one, Guyana, is who people look at you and assume Assume you might have voted for. Oh, uh, you look a little thingish. You can't get no recognition here. What some of these boys telling us is things Medal of Service should be made of. And not friends, family, and favorites. Some of these young men who helped pull young women, fetch them from this fire. They deserve some medals. Medal of service. What have you risking the lives at such a moment, historical moment? This can be the, probably the worst fire we've had as a country. Risk the lives. This should be brought to state house as well. This should be brought to state house as well. 
And you're hearing the stories are corroborating. One man said he ran out of his bed. He had time to put on a pants. He heard the dogs howling. Howling. Another gentleman last night on our program. We showed the video. He said, eh, no fire service went here when we got on the ground. That's what he said. Take a quick look. Let me take a quick look at what our brother said. Let me take a quick look. Tyrone Road for it. Yeah, the night was the on the incident when the dogs burned down. We was going on like quarter to like after you let me say. And why people you know we are nice by the dorm was four of us going on and five. So why is we stop now? We say what? Well, all the man beating you more like the boy. You said you man say why? You can't be the man beating you more man. You gotta be like the dorms, like devil going inside them. I saw one of my friends a man, he got in a seat. Then he said, alright, let me go. And when we if we walk and we go in, we hear more night screaming, open the door, open the door, open the door, and we start doing more brisk walk because we want to see what we're going we reach, and we see his fire, and now the kids are running out from the yard, opening the gate and calling for call the fire police. And we did not know now for no fire police. I we send the kids and by my big man is Scotty. Go and tell Scotty he call the fire police. And when we rush in the yard, was a big man went in with the shots, helping people at the time. But we were the five people, a couple more body went in, but everybody was afraid to go in the building with the fire. And at the same time, was a man with Alan his son. He need his son, he need his son. And I said, boy, look at your body in front of the door. So he don't want to go. We had to force him, hold his foot, somebody hold my hand, and he go in and grab the one body and bring it out. So I said, look, he got one more body here. He said, no, he not go back for nobody. He need his son, he need his son, he need his son. Somebody hold my hand. And I stretch and I go in the car, I was too much to eat. And when I panic too, I, I get fast with the cars. I get weak to honestly to that. I get weak. Uh, when I see strength, strength arguing for their life, I get weak. Because I see them right there, I can't help them. And uh, we go and get up five by six big wood. And we rush in this grill, rush in this grill. To get out bodies. Car bodies was right there. Right? The fire police, no police was not there at the sea. Nobody was not there at the sea. It does if people were wrong was helping the people inside the building. So when you give the fire police and the credit, it's not no credit, you got to give the people who when they hold the credit. Call you get in the fire police do the best. All them go down there and just pick up the dead ones. Call them come, they come with no equipment. They come with three little boys when they came at the scene. Three little boys then can help themselves. Somebody had to take out the little boy kit to go inside the fire for safe bodies. We had to board the back wall to take out the people them who was who were alive, but maybe few of them died. When I go all them honestly to God, my skin grow because their skin are left in my hand. People trying to hold them. When I go in the fire for all them, they start, like I, I, I get weak because I hold two, three bodies like I get weak and they couldn't go back because I get weak. Cause when I see them die, people like I get weak. All they say is a calm for me. And the people who are wrong here get more strength and thank God. For them was there for help them one world life. But if you went them earlier, more people will be safe and then thing. But the back wall on the eastern side where they said it, the fire police and boy, we bore it. Everybody is so bore it. No fire police, no police not put their hand and help bore nothing. If the people on the ground help bore that wall and help secure for the girl plunge through the window. The girl plunge through the window and she get caught. Cutting out bodies out from the fires, whose oh, skin got burned by his feet. I couldn't go back with cars. Their skin was in my hand. And the smell, it was terrible. But thank God for who went there for the assist for the helping one who was alive right now. Because the one who was alive, and I said thank God for who was up there very early. Yeah, I like to see them forgive them more. Love because it was us on the ground before the fire police had came and who else came? Nobody would have died. You see what I'm telling you? I ain't lying. You see what I tell you? You hearing you seen that on DPI? You seen that on DPI? Chronicle? What's yet? The room with the news? Uh-uh.
Nope. Definitely, you haven't seen them by State House. They get him fly out to go by State House. Oh. All right. <laughs> Who no no share the live. Smash the emoji button, folks. Let me go down the road. Thanks to all of you who are joining us. Let's turn our attention to our guest. Folks, I sat down with Member of Parliament, veteran Member of Parliament, former Minister of Health, Volva Ann Lawrence, quite recently. And she was asked to stand in for the leader of the opposition. It was a reception and the recognition of our 70th anniversary, the Parliament of Guyana, and she gave remarks. She gave remarks. I want to share with you what she said at that reception in her remarks, and then we're going to have a discussion with her. Let's take a listen to what she said, her remarks, on that evening of the 70th anniversary, a few short days ago, 70th anniversary of the National Assembly. Here is what she said. Minister Gail Teixeira, performing the duties of president, ministers of government, speaker of the National Assembly, members of the diplomatic corps, former and present members of parliament, former prime minister, Mr. Moses Virsami Nagamutu, special invitees. Good evening. I wish on behalf of the leader of the opposition, Aubrey Compton Norton, to express his sincere regrets at not being able to be here to celebrate with you. Notwithstanding, I read the following on his behalf. The supreme organs of democratic power in Guyana shall be the first parliament, secondly the president, and thirdly cabinet. The constitution also states quite emphatically there shall be a parliament of Guyana which shall consist of the president and the national assembly, articles 50 and 51 of our constitution. It is not my intention to confuse the National Assembly with the Parliament, but it is my deliberate intention to illustrate that the Constitution birthed dual embryos for good government and good governance in Guyana. Today, we celebrate the 70th anniversary of one of those embryos, the Parliament. As is traditional with all celebrations, we course through the annals of history and highlight those moments that gives us reason to celebrate or contemplate. We must celebrate on this auspicious occasion the victories of universal adult suffrage and struggles for self-governance. We must never forget that it was in this space a resolution was passed unanimously to begin the discussions on the granting of independence. We must also celebrate the achievements of our National Assembly in the area of human rights and freedoms, diplomacy, finance, education, surpassing the quota for women in our National Assembly, reviewing of our standard orders and procedural manual, not forgetting the addition of our several select committees. That is just a few of our achievements. But those achievements, in greater part, is owed to collaboration and bipartisanship within this space. Now for the contemplations in his report, Needs Assessment of the Guyana National Assembly, Sir Michael Davies, Commonwealth Senior Parliamentary Staff, advisor to the Guyana National Assembly, identified particular shortcomings 
of the National Assembly. For example, lack of independence of the parliament and its management from the control of the executive. Members who are not sufficiently au fait with the role within the parliamentary framework and the lack of awareness of the National Assembly's responsibility to relate with civil society, the private sector, and the wider public. Ladies and gentlemen, our people subscribe to a system of democracy that ensures the process of election is free and fair, and further, that their elected representatives are afforded the opportunity to effectively serve their interests. The hallowed space within the interests of our people are ventilated and served in our National Assembly. It has stood since 1953 when Dr. Chetty Jagan and Lyndon Forbes Sampson Burnham and other heroes entered. This hallowed space 70 years ago was certainly different. Then our elected representatives, legislative agendas were viewed as subordinate to the whims of the British interests. Today, it is the view of many Guyanese. We have replaced the British with the executive. It is their view the National Assembly, instead of being treated as a separate and equal embryo, is treated as a co-joint twin of the executive. Sir Davies, in his report in paragraphs 18 and 19, I quote, said, steps must be taken to establish the National Assembly as an institution independent of the executive. This is necessary that the legislature can truly keep the executive under scrutiny. Throughout this report, I have identified areas where the separation of powers is not observed in respect of the National Assembly. Meetings of the National Assembly are entirely at the whim of the executive." End of quote. If we aren't independent at 870, when will we be independent, fellow Guyanese? We are duty-bound to fight for the independence of the National Assembly. Mr. Speaker, I dare say you as the shepherd within these halls, yours is the greatest responsibility in holding the line of battle. The spirit of bipartisanship must emanate from your seat. For too long, the National Assembly has been used as a tool of executive aggression and repression. Therefore, the opposition will continue to be resolute in ushering in a new dispensation, a new culture within the National Assembly, a culture of mature leadership amongst its cadres and working relationship with stakeholders. As in 1953, when our founding fathers, with pride, relish the challenge of bringing hope to our countrymen, we, the opposition, will use this hallowed space to bring hope and change to all Guyanese. Happy 70th anniversary. Thank you. Yep, 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 yep. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only, the one and only MP. Member of Parliament, Volda Ann Lawrence. The Honorable Volda Ann Lawrence. Comrade Lawrence, a very good afternoon. And welcome to our broadcast. I think you were given the task of being the, uh, giving remarks quite recently on behalf of the Leader of the Opposition, the Parliamentary Opposition, on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the National Assembly. Towards the end of your presentation, you made a point, really and truly, that Parliament is not where it should be. Talk to us about that. First, thank you very much for having me, and good afternoon to all of the viewers out there. 
Sherrod, our parliament just celebrated its 70th anniversary, birth anniversary. And the question is, where are we as a young democracy? And I would say that we are still striving and we seem to be struggling. And to put it in more plain words, we seem to be stuck. We have so much to do to ensure that we can move forward and make the parliament what it ought to be. Allow the parliament to give to the Guyanese people the type of leadership that it ought to give. In our National Assembly, we are still stuck with one, the president being the head of the parliament. Although he doesn't sit in the National Assembly, he's the head. And every political party, when they're out of office, will say, oh, the president should not be the head of the parliament. The parliament should be independent, which is true. In this modern day democracy, the parliament should be independent. And several years ago, I did attempt to take a bill to the National Assembly as an opposition member to have the parliament made independent. That is independent of the president, independent of the cabinet, as we see taking place today. Notwithstanding that motion was voted down, I must say, voraciously by the P who was in government at that time. And here we are, several years later, and we are still there. What is good for us, however, is that we were able to have a review done of our parliament by the, an advisor to the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, Mr. Davies. And that Davies report gives us several recommendations. And he didn't just come up with that. He spent several months here with us before providing us with that report. So he had very good interaction with the parliamentarians at that time, ex-parliamentarians, the public at large, etc. Before he came up with his recommendation, he saw firsthand how we operated. And one of the good things that came out of that is that we did take a look again at our committee's system and did make some changes to our committee system, which is, I would say, is the element, is the crux presently in the parliament that will allow the parliament to function if the parliament, uh, parliamentarians are allowed to use those committees. And I say that because of this. You have two types of committees. You have standing committees like the Public Accounts Committee, and we all see what is happening in there. We also have the Constitutional Reform Committee, and we're told that this committee will start its work later in the year. That is not what this committee is there for, to turn on and turn off like a light bulb. This committee is there, and it is there to continuously review our constitution and our laws, etc., and make recommendations to the National Assembly so that we can be able to have a more modern piece of constitutional framework to work with as a country that is developing. Secondly, there are the select committees and there are the special select committees. These are powerful committees. There is the National Natural Resource Committee, there's the Social Sector Committee, there's the Foreign Relation Committee, and there is the there's one other committee that I cannot recall at this time. But these committees provides the members of the committee with the opportunity to call ministers before them so that they can report or so that they can be enlightened 
into any particular aspect of the ministerial work, policies, etc. And to ensure that those policies and programs that are being rolled out by the ministers in the various sectors, that they entail within them good governance. And we can talk all we want, but we do have the tools, the mechanisms in the parliament through these committees to use them to enable us to hold the government accountable. And not only to hold them accountable, but also to highlight where their policies or their programs may not be beneficial to all of the people of this country. Where it may be harmful to a particular group or a particular sector. And here is also where civil society can play a role because the sec these sectoral committees can invite civil society groups and organizations to come and to make um, proposals based on the government's policies, based on our laws, based on things that are happening within our country that from their viewpoint, they believe that we should make some changes. And the sad thing is that these committees are not meeting and many times when they meet, we don't get out of the committee the purpose that the committee is there for. For my own personal view, I believe too many times it's tough. We don't get down into the nitty gritty. We don't do the hard work. We don't get other persons, other voices on board to hear their views so that we can be able to make recommendations based on a collective view and not just the parliamentarians from one side of the divide or the other making these recommendations but also getting civil society and other organizations involved and hearing from them. If these committees are allowed to work and function in the way that they ought to, then we will see so much more happening in terms of the policies and programs being put out there by whichever government holds the seat because they will be held accountable. Comrade Lawrence, we heard the Alliance for Change leader, Ms. Ramjitan, made a point on the same issue of committees meeting. I think it's the social sector committee which would talk with people like the Minister of Home Affairs and those issues, mm -hmm. fire drills and different other issues, not meeting and perhaps that's why we're not seeing such a robust effort in this regard and we only have the murder tragedy on the silhouette of our discussion as one of the examples of things not going right. One. And two, the government seems to be busy doing a lot of things. But when you, as you said, you get on into the nitty gritty, not much is really being done. And again, we can look at the Mali issue as just one of those issues. A lot of motions come from the opposition. A lot of, a lot of questions come that seem not to find space in the National Assembly. Committees are not meeting. Where are we and how do we move forward? All right. Thank you for asking that. And thank you for highlighting that the opposition do put motions and they do put several questions on the order paper at every sitting but those questions remain there for a very long time i can give you an example of myself i sent a question to the minister of public works since december of last year and i never got an answer until april of this year and it beats the purpose for which I wanted to have the minister answer that question because I believe that it would have helped us in terms of the questioning that we would have asked at the budget time. But here it is, not only myself encountered that, but all of the MPs on the opposition side, that our question takes months for it to come on the order paper and for us to have an answer. And likewise, the motions, 
you send stuff in and you have to wait weeks or over a month before you get a response saying that the speaker has accepted your question or has accepted your motion. And that is why I started off by saying that we really need to look deep in terms of our constitutional reform. And when we do so, we have to look at the parliament. Do we still want to have this system where the president, even though he's represented in the National Assembly by the Prime Minister and all of his ministers, but he is still the overarching head of the parliament? Or do we want to see a parliament that is independent, where the parliament is setting the agenda based on the information which they have, where the parliament is being able to call the committees and set the agenda, etc., for the committees, the timings and so on. And then we don't get all these excuses that this person is a minister and they have to be here and that person is a minister and they own the country and all of that and so you can't hold meetings. And even if that was the excuse now, information technology have helped us to overcome that. Because irrespective of where you are, you can join a meeting. And the parliament do have dual meetings where you can either attend in person or you can join online. So we're stepping up in that department. But once again, I say to you that the parliament is too political. We need to see a speaker that does not have to answer to the executive in that we employ you, we put you there. We need to change the system of how we um, elect our speakers. Perhaps we should have a runoff and, and have persons from civil society nominate themselves or groups nominate persons and, and then those persons will be elected to be the speaker. And so we have persons who are independent coming into the National Assembly. And so they have the ambit to be able to work with both administration and opposition, but from a position where they stand as an independent. We don't have that. We continue and we will continue down this road to see our parliament divided if you look at our amendments brought by opposition MPs, the amendment is a good amendment, but the government will find some way to change that amendment so that the amendment will now go on the records that the government made an amendment, not the opposition MP. And the second thing I don't think in the National Assembly, we listen to each other. I don't think we listen to each other. We get so caught up with the tit for tat and uh, during my research to do my remarks, I was reading an article which spoke to the parliamentarians get so engulfed in the heckling that really you don't get any substance from the presentations in the National Assembly. And that in itself is a turn off to people who may have an interest in listening to the parliament, listening to the debates, listening to the questions and answers and so on, trying to form their own opinion. They get turned off by all of that. And so I think we have to be a little more tactful in what we do and we have to really come with substance and stop the playing for the gallery. I also want to point out, Cheryl, that the time has come for us to stop using the floor of the parliament to make decisions. The government is taking a line of a one Guyana. A one Guyana, in my opinion, dictates that the two sides sit at the table and hammer out whatever it is the government is bringing to the National Assembly at whatever committee they want to call it, ad hoc committee, special committee, whatever they want to call it. And then it goes to the floor. Instead of it coming to the floor, 
we don't understand the views of the government, why they're bringing X or why they're bringing Y. And we're hearing it for the first time. You can't digest all of that at the same time. But you have to get up and represent the Guyanese people who may feel that bill is going to interfere with my life. It's going to interfere with my business. It's going to interfere with the future generations of this country because people call us, people talk to us. And so you have the war going on. And if I can recall, I remember Speaker Raphael Trotman. We always had conversations. How can we diffuse this great tension and this great theater that the floor has turned into? How can we diffuse that? We thought when we were at Brigdam that it was because we were sitting across from each other. So it lends to itself. I have to attack you. You have to attack me because the aisle is the divide. And whether we needed to change the seating, etc. So there was some discourse about that. And I wish that we can see much more discussions on how we can be able to change, take away that aggression from within the parliament and give to the Guyanese people more substance for, from the parliamentarians in terms of the bills and the motions and the questions and so on. Thank you very much, MP Lawrence. On the issue, very issue of motions and bills, at some very critical times in our nation's history, in the recent past, we've brought motions I wouldn't want to use the word debate because of their sensitivity, but to discuss them as a National Assembly. We've always found a way, the, the speakers always found a way to say they're not urgent, they're not of public importance. We had a motion on the Henry Boys. We had a motion on the food flood, prices, uh, on food prices mm -hmm. the cost of living. We had one on the last major flood yes. that we've had. They were always of no public importance and not urgent. I dare say on the occasion of the flood, the very day after that motion came to the floor, Irfan Ali declared the flood a national disaster. I would argue that if we brought one on the Mario fire, they would tell us it's not urgent or of public importance. That being said, I want to give you an opportunity to talk to this nation, to perhaps put this seminal moment in our nation's history in context. Thank you. First, let me express condolences to the families, to the villages, to the people of the township of Madia and the entire region 8, who is mourning the loss of the tragic death of these children. This is something that will not go away. It will remain in our history for many decades to come people will refer to it but what do we do in these times in these times i think two things comes first one is security and the second one is the human factor i say security because we are focusing just on the children who would have died in the fire but they were survivors too and their parents whose children would have just written the grade six examinations and they have already thought about sending their children to stay in the dorms so it is not just about those families who are experiencing this tragic moment. It is about all these other people, the workers, etc. And so we need to very quickly, and I call on the Minister of Human Services, to very quickly put together a team to get in to Region 8, both sub-regions 1 and 2, and to have discussions I don't know how many persons we do have in the country that can help with the psychological effect on these persons today we heard of one of the students 
try to commit suicide and this is going to continue this has this particular dormitory have a history of events that is not one that makes you feel safe because just a year or so ago we had and we have seen videos of these very young people being possessed we have seen pastors and men and women of God praying and casting out spells etc from these young people and so that region when it comes to children staying in the dormitory they're traumatized and I'm quite certain there are many students who passed to go to the secondary school but was never sent because of the fear of the parents and so as a nation I want to say to people I am tired of seeing all the things on Facebook at least for once let us be positive could we start putting up some suggestions out there what is it that can be done what resources do we have in sub-region one and two we have a whole host of churches and we have some NGOs what can be done in terms of pulling them together and put them to work in the various villages and communities and listen I'm not casting blame on anybody but I believe there are many people who are responsible today I saw a video with the kids going down to the creek to bathe they don't have a bathroom simple things like that and these are the things that we overlook especially when you're in the coastland you don't know what is happening in the hinterland areas unless you go and for yourself a couple years ago it was the toilets it was schools having pit latrines and until a child met her demise then we started to install flush toilet come on we're a rich nation. We got money to put up billboards all over the place. Couldn't we not give these people the basic necessities? And I think we have to start even from there. We're talking about smoke alarms and fire extinguishers and so. That is a given. It means that the Minister of Labor, who is in charge of the health and occupation safety, department got to get up to that's why i said i'm not blaming any particular person because how it is though inspections were made at these schools and so on to ensure that they have the necessary equipment in case of an emergency how is it that it's only now we're hearing that the children are locked from inside all of these are things that we as a nation have to start churning in our minds and stop saying it's not my business or I am not a politician because those kids are not politicians perhaps they may have been if they had the opportunity to grow into adulthood and so it's all of our responsibility let's stop the theatrics let's stop the photographs and all of that and let's really get down to business. I would have been happy to hear the president say that, look, I have already called in the fire chief, the police, the head of the occupation, health and safety department, etc., etc., to start a committee that will review the recommendations that was made several years ago in terms of our fire codes, etc., in these public places because it's not just dorms do the police officers the training school do they have smoke alarms do they have fire extinguishers our prisons do they have our homes do they have come on it cannot be a band-aid method we cannot use a band-aid to stop this big porous sore which we have in our society as a people we never took those things seriously but i trust that through this tragic incident 
we would surely look at the bigger picture, the broader picture, and the government will come up with a plan that says, in the next six months, we are going to do this. In the next six months, we are going to do that. In the next six months, we are going to do that. And so that we can fix it all around. We have all these children, homes, and so on. Do we have all these things in place? We need to take stock. MP Lawrence, thanks so much for spending this time with us and for putting these issues into context. Thank you. You're most welcome. All right, folks. That's our discussion today. That's our discussion. Honorable Valdan Lawrence, again, thanks for joining our podcast today, folks. And we 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 got a hard a hard landing today. We got to run off to some other things. So we're going to see you back on the podcast tomorrow, folks. That's our time, and that's our program. Thanks for joining us. That's our time. And that's our program. Stay safe, folks. Stay safe. That's going to do it for us. That's our time.